Hi, my name is Jesse Quack, and I am the editor of the Crooked series of sci-fi crime anthologies. I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end of this presentation, but right now I want to introduce Jim Keen, who's going to be reading from volume two of this series. Um, this was originally recorded on November 12th. Jim writes books about the people who fascinate him in worlds that amaze him. He loves crime, thrillers, and stories about people with secrets. If there's not a big twist along the way, he'd never write the first word. The international best-selling Alice U series takes place 40 years from now in a world transformed by mechanical intelligences, AI's big brother. Yu is a loner cop atoning for past sins. Through the series, she discovers what it is to be human while becoming something much more in the process. If you like the post-apocalyptic techno-thrillers of A.J. Riddle, Hugh Howey, and William Gibson, you'll love the thrilling Alice U series. Take it away, Jim. Great, thank you. November 22nd, 2054, San Francisco, USA. The vast translucent egg hovered over the bay's black water, its thick skin sparkling with fractal patterns like a broken VR feed. Sarah's electric ferry hummed towards it, wide hull gouging a scar across the oily surface as she pressed her handkerchief to her mouth. The foul air stank of burnt plastics, the smell stinging her eyes and throat. No one else seemed to notice, and, more than ever, Sarah felt every second of her provincial upbringing. It took ten awful days to get here from Brazil. Then, like every other drifter washing up in San Francisco, she'd leased a capsule in a local metabolist hotel. Four long months squashed into that tiny space revealed itself in every crease of a cheap suit, every scuff on her worn shoes. As building 116 grew ahead of them, its three huge steel legs in stark contrast to the pollution's gritty texture, Sarah checked her appearance for the thousandth time. Thin and tired face, short black hair, chewed nails. She looked as much a hack as anyone else who worked for the agency, but the boat was strapped with people who smelled of money and access. Razor edged suits, honed physiques, bleached skin, exquisite eye gear, even their reprinted limbs match the color and freckles of the original body, only their pale blue zip scars revealing the lab-grown origin. No, here she was very much the tourist. The call had come as a surprise, an encrypted response to an ad she'd posted in the job search channel the day she'd arrived. It had sat next to a resume like the corpse of a dead dog while she clipped through the hundreds of temp jobs the coding agency found for her rebalancing power channels for the low confusion distribution center, automating the aerial camera drones coverage of speeding hoppers, backing up and distributing every virtual conference in the city, kid stuff. And then this sneak outreach, the message hidden away inside the system code of an elephant guzzle ad. Guzzle ads and their cute animatronic pink elephant have been quite the hit a few years back being one of the first true interactives to hit the networks. Then some slide knife guys cracked their code and made it shareware, spawning a billion memes for the tweener crowds. She'd ignored it at first. I mean, what sort of jerk uses a guzzler ad to advertise a job anyway? But then, after a week of disastrous interviews, she got drunk on homebrew vodka and reopened the message. The initial ask was for someone to code an AR porn setup, but it was written with an elegance that hooked her. No one bothered honing random messages down to such tight and clean size these days. She dove in and dove deeper. There, a thousand layers down, just as the sun was rising to greet her hangover, Sarah cracked a subroutine and a soft male voice whispered from her laptop speakers, the accent matching a provincial farmer's Portuguese perfectly. Miss Ultieres, it's a pleasure to meet you. I hope you forgive this little test but I've been tracking your progress and for someone of your intuitive skills, using a guzzle ad is borderline insulting. However, Solimute has the hoops to jump through just like any other boring conventional coding corporation. That stopped Sarah, the words bringing an adrenaline flush that blew away her fatigue like napalm through palm trees. Solimute, the anonymous collective that cracked to the Oshika labs and gave away their skeleton print files for free that ran the Golden Bear Fund into bankruptcy, that stole and released Cortex's fusion reactor software. Solely mute, either a force for societal good or chaotic destruction, depending upon which side of the poverty gap you existed on. 
She sat up in a cramped, sweaty capsule in the hotel's eastern cluster, scraped her hair back and pressed play. I have a proposition for you. Six months work for a considerable payday. Let's meet for coffee and I shall explain all. With that, the advert rolled itself up and ran a detox program so complicated Sarah couldn't follow half what it did. Little Pink Elephant was replaced with a ferry ticket to building 116, the sovereign startup incubator that occupied San Francisco Bay like an alien spaceship. The building's true scale only became apparent as she approached, its supporting tripod of legs appearing stick thin from the harbor's edge. A dock surrounded the front leg, a sliding elliptical landing pad that rose and sank with the tide. The ferry was carrying 300 people, yet the platform dwarfed it in size its flat deck pierced by the huge steel leg that climbed a hundred feet to disappear into the ed egg's thick, translucent skin. The ferry pulled alongside. A series of discreet clangs shook the boat as underwater hooks secured it in place. Then a ramp unfolded with a light mechanical groan and the ferry emptied. So didn't know who she was to meet or where, so she followed the crowd as they filled into three glass elevators each larger than a farm's living room. They rose with a soft hum, and once more Sarah felt like the tourist she was. The view was incredible, yet the other occupants ignored the vista as they read headset feeds or received internal messages via some form of neural clock. A few, wearing thick white shirts with handlebar moustaches and shaved heads, even used ancient handheld terminals, their ding alerts loud in the hushed quiet. She turned back to the view. San Francisco had suffered as much as anywhere from the mass unemployment, but whereas New York's exalted had retreated inside mile-high blade towers, San Francisco had taken a different approach. The city was shrouded by its perpetual umber pollution cloud, the fog broken by a series of white blisters that reflected the sunlight like polished marble. These were the fuller domes, lighter-than-air enclaves draped over the desirable zones and guarded by the latest autonomous system. The gaps in between them had become a festering mix of slums populated by the unemployed and organized crime gangs. As she watched, the city's hazy outline sparkled with air assets and security drones maintaining the separation, while aerial police hoppers darted from one flashpoint to another. Sarah's father forbade her from coming here said she had no idea how lucky she was to live far from these cities. She thought he was full of it, just wanted her to stay for cheap labor, but maybe the old bastard was right after all. Building 116 had been the first in a supposed new generation of green buildings. Its egg form promoted passive cooling or something. Sarah wasn't sure how, but it looked cool. The owners, some Middle Eastern consortium, paid the bankrupt city an immense sum for it to become a sovereign land. In effect, Building 116 was its own country, and that meant anything went here. From chemical weapon design, to lethal AI coding, to the latest VR snuff channel. All that brain power was squashed into this spaceship and left to ferment. Most of what it produced suffered the Darwinian fates of typical startups, but occasionally something emerged that had global, global ramifications. Something like Solomute. The elevator slowed, stopped, chimed, and opened its doors. The reception area was a large white box, and Sarah stood, unsure, when a foot-long teardrop-shaped aerostat drifted down from the ceiling. With a subtle hiss, it halted at eye level, and there was a momentary sparkle of gritty green light as it scanned her left retina. It knew everything about her now, from school grades to the last time she got drunk in a bar. Wait here. His plastic voice buzzed rather than spoke the words. Sure, yeah, whatever, Sarah said in the agricultural English she'd learned from TV. One by one, the elevator's other occupants were greeted by feral businessmen or soft, pudgy tech people. She wasn't sure how long she waited, but it was at least an hour, and she lapped the reception space like a caged animal, torn between the desire to stay and see if this was real or give in and troop back to her fetid little hotel room. Finally, as she was getting ready to go, an elevator descended from some distant floor. A handsome if weather-beaten man in a smart blue suit exited. He was tall, pale and thin with a scruffy beard. Apologies, Miss Yultieres. Some business can wait, some cannot. Sarah ignored the slight and nodded to him. Call me Sarah, it's easy here. Sarah it is. Now then, why don't we get that coffee?
Sarah sat at a low wooden table close to the veranda's southern edge, her face warmed by the slanting sunlight. The restaurant occupied the corner of an upper floor, the building's skin cut back to allow external access. This far up, the cold air smelled clean and fresh, with none of the chemical residue of low down. Birds cried in the distance, and somewhere a wind chime ghosted a distant tune. Packed tables were crammed into the space, the atmosphere thick with tense and urgent conversations. What do I call you, Sarah asked. Max, he said. His voice held a weird foreign accent she'd not heard for before. Maybe German? Sarah had no idea what Europeans really sounded like. That your real name, she asked. Of course it isn't. Now, to business, shall we? He waved over Sarah's shoulder, and she was shocked to see an actual human offer Max a menu, which he refused. Bring me a coffee still. Large, two cups. The man nodded and left. Max did Sarah then, head tilted to one side, blue eyes glittering. Where did you learn to code, Sarah? Your style has a unique flavor to it. I'm self-taught. Grew up on my dad's farm and didn't go to school or anything like that. I picked up tons from open access channels, home university, things like that. The rest was just me hacking away at this old farm drone to see what it could do. It used to be a war machine, but I got it to do our house chores, cleaning and stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Most of the people we get to interview are all educated in the same universities. That makes them rich, intelligent, and entirely predictable. We're looking for someone a little more original in their thinking. Tell me, Sarah. He clipped a name as if it was distasteful to him, the words leaving his mouth in a staccato gunfire. What do you know of Cortex reprints? Sarah paused, unsure. Cortex was the world's only source of sentient machines and, through them, the human scan and reprint systems. That was billionaire's territory, though. It has much to do with her as a fuller dome did to a mud hut. Just the press releases, she shrugged. We don't get many prints where I come from. Interesting. Don't you live in the same valley as the Suarez cartel? And there it was. It seemed she was forever destined to be seen through the lens of Brazil's trillion-dollar drugs gang. Sure, yeah, my farm looks down into their favela. That don't mean I hang with the 1%, though, jerk off. They've got working girls for that. Now, do you have any real questions for me? Or is this just some bullshit fishing expedition for rumors on their tech? You're not even solar mute, are you? You're just some dumbass cop searching for a little southern taste. Max leant back in his seat and laughed, voice warm and happy. Oh, Sarah, Sarah, he said. At times it's easy to forget I exist in a bubble. And if that has impacted my manners, please forgive me. For the record, I am as far removed from an officer of the law as one can possibly be. And yes, represent California's Solomute franchise in all its forms. With that, he reached up and spread his eyelids open. In the slanted sunlight, Sarah saw the red capillaries glint a brassy texture. You're a reprint, Sarah said, voice tinged with awe. An early model developed in New York, but you are right. I am not human as you understand it. Hi, and welcome back. I promised I'd tell you a little bit more about Crooked at the end, and here we are. Um, so what is Crooked? It's a series of sci-fi crime anthologies that have been edited by me, and the idea is that it exclusively focuses on including stories that are part of a bigger universe. So this is what kind of what sets Crooked apart. If you came to this anthology because you wanted to read the story from one author whose series you love, Hopefully you'll find another author who writes kind of in a similar style or writes you know, maybe something dissimilar, but you know, just something that you're into. You can then go and read that story and be like, oh, I want more of these characters, head to their website and find more of their work. So for example, if you love this reading, check out the show notes below and you'll get a link to the author's website. So this has been an incredibly fun anthology series to work on. Um, Please keep an eye out for round three, which will be coming next year sometime. And if you enjoyed this reading, please support the author. Go buy their books. Head to bit.ly slash crookedv2, and you can find this anthology to find more of the stories. And yeah, I hope you had a really good time, and take care out there. Bye.